Oh my gosh, we've got Eli Harwood. Eli Harwood is a licensed therapist, author, educator, social media star, and creator of the Attachment Nerd platform. She has more than 17 years of experience helping people process relational traumas and develop secure attachment relationships. Eli has three children, one hubby, two cats, and an extraordinary number of plant babies. We are definitely kindred spirits to the plant babies. And the exciting news today, her new book, Raising Securely Attached Kids, Using Connection-Focused Parenting to Create Confidence, Empathy, and Resilience, is out today. Welcome and congratulations, Eli. We're so happy and proud of you. How are you feeling? Oh, I just you feel the marathon. like I gave birth. Oh, yes, no, like I've did. been you in totally pregnant and laboring and finally it's out. It's finally out and I'm so oh my excited gosh. and it's it's just a joy. Well, it's such a beautiful book. If you're watching, you're I'm holding up this amazing cover. It's just so artistic and beautiful and there's um some great blurbs including one from Hillary Swank and Dan Dr. Dan Siegel and so many other superstar luminaries whose judgment we trust. And I got so much out of it. I just, I devoured it. I, um, and I, I don't want to give too much away right now because we're going to talk a lot about it um, throughout the uh, time we're together. But I want to ask you, as somebody who's been practicing as long as you have and who has written another book, what, what was your either number one big aha, big takeaway? Because when you write, you learn, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um if there was a number one big aha takeaway, and if there wasn't, then what is the number one big aha takeaway you want people who are reading it to get? Well, as a parent in the weeds myself, you know, I think writing the book is an exercise for me of my own cycle breaking and my process of trying to offer my kids a secure experience. And I think the thread is fairly simple in its concept and complicated in its application. But the thread is the most important thing that I am doing for my children is cultivating a relationship with them. So no matter what I'm trying to teach them or where I'm trying to guide them or what thing they're doing or not doing, the wisdom of the scientific data <laughs> is returning to connection and recognizing that things like compassionate understanding um, reflecting on our own childhoods, um, utilizing empathy in a hard moment. Those things are actually interventions for our children, in not just in their behavior or in the moment, but for their lifelong journey. But what's interesting in your book, you talk about like right in the beginning, you dispelled the myth. And I, I can't remember if it was, I, I want to say James Watson, but I feel like it's, a, I'm talking about a different James. Oh, like, it's yeah, um, like, be well it's not okay somebody, again, i'm getting watson else. and skinner the last name yeah. is watson you are right oh oh my god i'm so impressive <laughs> i'm like wait where did yes. that come from yes. um but you talk about that that not only command and control parenting but the guy literally was like and this wasn't that long ago 100 something years ago was like do not kiss your children do not hug your children do yes. not be affectionate with your children and what is crazy to me and you 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 rectify this by saying listen for um, many, many generations, thousands of years, families have raised kids with, with, they didn't call it secure attachment because that science has only been around for 70 years, but they, they embraced their babies and they, you know, they, yes. uh, not to it's get how too much. the human lesson. species has survived and evolved. This is, you know, I like to say this isn't new information. Right. This is as old as human beings. This is a new understanding of the information. And so when I, I get a little prickly sometimes when people are like, oh, this newfangled parenting, oh, blah, yeah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, actually, yeah, <laughs> what's newfangled is the stuff that started coming around around the time of colonialism, right, and the Industrial Revolution. And that that's the newfangled. Like when we look at the span of human history, human beings have always been a social species. And in our social relationships, we find the greatest sense of resilience and adaptation and we literally know from the science that our brains develop optimally when we have effectively secure, close relationships. So it's not newfangled, people. It's yeah, no, I, inherent. Well, totally. 
And, and that's what what's interesting is just how totally wrong, totally misguided that that advice and how that mm-hmm. has messed up a lot of families, a lot of kids who have gone on to have their own families. I mean, honestly, it reminds me of like, what was that? The Atkins diet. I even did mm-hmm. the Atkins diet. Like, yeah, worst yeah. thing to do to your body. And yet there was like at least a decade or two, people were doing the Atkins diet. And it was like, yes. well, that's a bad idea. Yep. Right. Yep. And I just so I, I really want to um, emphasize the point up front that you I mean, you literally just said the number one thing you can do is cultivate the relationship with your child. And that as as yes. intuitive as it is to me, because I've built a whole publishing business for 20 plus years on relationships. That feels like a big duh. But it's <laughs> but it's not right. No. I mean, so many we you know, my dad literally said to me the other day, you can't be friends with your kids. I'm like, right. what? <laughs> you know, no. Yes. OK, dad, love you. And he's you know, he's a sweet guy and he he's well intentioned. But that kind of old school thinking. And I realize friends are, you know, right. I, I want to be a little careful and not um, deconstruct that. It's too a, much. Yeah, it's a false binary. You don't have exactly. to choose. Yes. It's saying, oh, God, look at that. Snap. False binary. <laughs> <laughs> and I I just feel like for, for everybody listening to think, ooh, building the relationship. And, you know, you did mm-hmm. such a beautiful job. And, and I will say this, you know, author to author, um, your book is so conversational. It's, it, <laughs> it is easy to read and still packed with actionable takeaways. It's really like talking to you which oh, is hard yay. to do as an author. Yeah, no, and you, you know, I like how you call yourself a Karen. I mean, you call yourself out <laughs> in a way, no, but, in, but seriously, you like- In, in a moment ways, where I was, ha- I was having a Karen moment. That was yeah, a Karen moment. It, it's okay to label it that, yeah. Totally, <laughs> and I feel like for us, and you know, I, I mean, no offense to all the Karen, I, I mean, a lot of Karens, I love you, <laughs> but we know that, you know, like it's it's unfortunate if your name is Karen, but, but we know what that means. We know when somebody- has Mm -hmm. gotten dysregulated especially in a public place and Mm -hmm. it is really uncomfortable to watch and and Mm -hmm. i've been there too many times Mm -hmm. um joanna you've talked about some of these experiences too where you feel so terrible and uncomfortable afterward but i think for us to talk about these things um to release ourselves and to release everybody else uh you know who it's like oh my god i'm not alone in in having had that and i love how you talk about how you made that repair and that you said, listen, and that really, that that was a turning point. And I, I yeah. haven't gone back so to that. What is the story? Because now I'm super interested. Well, what did I'm, Eli do? I'm, Eli. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, okay, there's so many different layers to this book. I just want to just say that it makes me so happy that you had that experience because my entire goal in writing this book is to take this body of research that I love with all of my heart and trust in mm-hmm. the deepest cells of my body and make it accessible and make it emotionally motivating, you know, that you can read it and go, okay, this is why my mission is to create a secure relationship with my kids. And well, this and is it's what so and how to do it. This is how yeah, and it's so it. hopeful. And you give you give us parents not only to be permission to, you know, to to own our care in times, right? And mm-hmm. not not, you mm-hmm. know, feel uh overlaid with shame. But it's like no matter where you are in the parenting journey and you were very deliberate. Like if you got if you've got a, a little proverbial uh like uh, bun in the oven to okay your children are grown that there is there is something in it for everybody and I love how you yep. even call out like if you've got grown children you're reading this like good for you because yes. it probably suggests that there is a uh, some disconnection there but it's not too late they're working and on they, it yeah, yeah they're making the efforts that's incredible mm-hmm. right well, instead of just you, staying in defense land Totally. And like wondering why. I mean, we've all seen those TikToks where there's, you know, somebody, a, a, an adult child has gone no contact and it's typically the mom is going like, I don't get it, you know, and it's just like, yes. oh, my God, you know, let's try and get on. it. Let's try and figure it out. I mean, yeah. OK, so we'll try not to squirrel. The three of us are such squirrelers and I love it so much. But <laughs> um, there I just heard a statistic recently that one in four adults is estranged from a parent. So oh, there's wow. like an estrangement surprised. epidemic going on. And a, a big That's piece insane. of the puzzle, I believe, is this attachment trauma, is parents mm-hmm. who yeah. have mindsets about parenting that ultimately create alienation in their relationship with their child. And so I want people to have as much information as they can about how not to do that. This is how not to get yourself rejected by your child when they enter adulthood. You know, we're looking at the long game as parents. So One thing that is related to that is taking us back to that Karen moment. So I talk about how 
when our kids are struggling, that when we offer them what's called reflective functioning, so we think about how their struggle is affecting us and what how what it's bringing up from our past, and we think about what's happening inside of them, and we can accurately offer understanding and compassion. Okay, for what's but going I gotta just them. chime in here because mm-hmm. reflective functioning is mm-hmm. really freaking hard to do in the moment. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, right. And so just to, you know, just for our audience and for my own, like, oh my God, I'm so, I feel, I, I've had to do a lot of mm-hmm. healing myself for feeling guilty for screwing that up when my kid starts to melt down. And then rather than yes. stay calm, like you suggest and remain, you know, and keep that connection. As or get sort back of the, to calmness. None yeah, of us usually as, are calm right at that beginning moment, right? Their, right? their emotion infects us. And then we have to figure out how to kind of pause take the piece of information they needed us to have and then get back to our centered totally state. so i've i'm guilty of escalating and so i just want to say this it's idea hard. of reflective functioning yes is is a practice right and i yes. if i can do it anybody else can do it because i'm a type AAA aries <laughs> <laughs> but okay so go I, back and Let's... i've actually got an example i can ask you about too of this exact thing okay well i'm going to tell you my quick example which is my husband doing this with me so i say like you know when we're down in the dumps what we don't need is punishment we don't need someone that's going to go if you do this again blah 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 and i'm really wanting to highlight for parents because i think we have such a control focused culture that it's very normal for people to think well of course i punish them of course i try to give them some form of suffering to motivate them not to do the stupid thing again so I'm telling the this story. This also with the Judeo. I mean, it's not even just Skinner and those old school psychiatrists and <laughs> psychologists and so forth. I mean, that is it very much in the Judeo Christian ethic. Culture. I, I believe, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. This idea of punishment and sin and well, and, and I would argue just, colonialism. You yeah, know, yeah. Colon- that the colonial mindset and how that came in and 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 ownership yeah, dominance over and so other forth. people's bodies. Yeah, hierarchy. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so okay, so I have just found out. The story is me and my husband have just found out that our second miscarriage, our second pregnancy in a row, has just become a miscarriage. So mm. we're on miscarriage number two. We're like ten and a half weeks in, mm. and we're devastated. And so my husband suggests that we go take a walk around this lake to just sort of process and figure out what we need to do and blah, 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 blah. So we we pull up and we have a season pass at this little state park thing. So we are in the season pass lane. And as we pull into the season pass lane, I call her the little elf, this little teenage elf who's in the kiosk waves us down. And we, normally you don't get waved down when you go through the pass lane. You just drive through. So she's like, waving well, hello and the hello and goodbye. No, just she, wave, she's wave not goodbye. waving me like that. She's like, stop. <laughs> like you're in oh, trouble. Oh, she's God. 16. And oh. She says, you can't have tape on your pass. And we have taped the pass to the van because it took me a minimum of two hours the last year, because you get a pass every year, to get that scrapey stuff off of the window. And so I thought, you know what? I'm just going to tape it on so I don't have to do that again. Well, I'm sure that this is like, you know, that we're not allowed to do this because then you could switch cars and a pass goes with a car and blah, 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 blah. But I just did this like yucky, domineering Karen vibe thing with her where I just sort of looked at her. I was like, yeah, we're not going to do that. Thanks very much. You know, I don't remember exactly what I said, but I very much postured and condescended and then drove off. Eh. Like, I don't care about your rules. I don't have to follow your rules. I'm just moving on. I mean, it was not me in my core best self. That's not how I handle situations or want to handle situations. And I'm, you know, I'm furiously driving into the little thing and getting the little spot and pulling over. And my husband looks over at me and just puts his hand on my leg. And all he says is, I'm really sad we lost this baby. Mm. And I just sobbed. I mean, uncontrollably, because it was like the I was in a place of profound loss, grief and powerlessness. And this poor kid ran into me in the wrong moment and tried to apply a rule that I just could not handle. Yeah. And and it instantly led me to a healthy amount of guilt about how I had just treated her. Right? I could see my behavior in that context and be like, she didn't deserve that. Yeah. <laughs> right? I could have just all, said. And oh. we're all guilty of that. And for even less, yeah. less moments of deep despair, yes. you know, I mean, I, I know a lot of women that have, have, you know, had miscarriages and that it's like there's hardly any worse feeling of grief 
<laughs> and I love that there's like a meme, like a big circle and then a little pinprick and it says with an arrow pointing on it, what you know about other people's lives. Yeah. Right. Yes. And, yeah. and it's like and a I, grain so it, of sand in the yes. whole beach. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, and so when I think and I remember you're writing in the book saying I, you actually went to make the repair and this uh, young gal had already left and, you know, but it's just but it's I such had, a, but I had um, processed and learned in my and my higher self, so to speak, my prefrontal cortex was back online. And the only intervention I had needed in that moment was for my husband to understand yeah. the pain beneath my Karen behavior. And if and he had come at you and been like, Eli, what the F? You are a totally. well, it, you would have like stayed that was in that fight mode. Oh my God, he would have had yeah. a, a fork in the neck. Yeah. Maybe so. It wouldn't have gone well. No, It certainly anybody. would not have led to reflection. But anyway, so I think that that that's the one of the core principles that I want parents to really hold with is that when you respond to your child with some level of understanding and compassion, you're not being permissive. You're right. trying to help them get yeah. back to a place where they can process and learn. And that when we try to control our children, they might learn to behave in our presence. Mm -hmm. But what they're doing is they're learning a game. And the game is who has the most power. And then they go out into the world with a power mindset. And then we end up with people like Putin. Yeah. You know, yeah. like that whose whole way of experiencing fulfillment in life is to dominate other people and yeah. bleh, like we don't need and more just we have all had that you know boss at the restaurant or on the the shop floor or whatever it is who seems to delight in holding meaningless power yes and when we do that with our kids you do start to see how they could grow up to be that now listen and, none of our of kids are going to be don't. putin no yeah it was and a dramatic it, Yeah, of example. course. But like you think about, you can picture in your head that one person who's just too excited to have yes. power over you. And it's, or, it's because they were probably totally powerless. Yes. Yeah. And they learned to deal in the currency of power. But the other thing is not everyone goes that direction, right? So if you, if you use power and control to relate to your children, they might just be anesthetized. Mm. to the experience of of abuse. So they go out into the world and someone is going to relate to them with power and control and they're like, this feels familiar. It's totally yeah. familiar. I'm going to bond with this person. Right? We want to give our children the skills to look out for people who ultimately are not going to take good care of their hearts, minds, bodies. Right. Mm -hmm. So how can we offer a template of relating that makes it so that when they do end up on that date with someone that says like, well, you know, I don't let any of my girlfriends talk to their ex-boyfriends. Oh, but yeah. they're like that that red flag goes up. That yeah. just that little weird. flag. That yeah. was yeah. weird. Right. And so anyway, that the point is we don't have to be our children's parole officer in order to offer them structure, guidance, and teaching. Okay. So now you've said this. Yes. And I have a situation I need help with. Okay. All right, and, hang on. Well, I was gonna say, just just for our listeners and viewers. Eli has graciously agreed to do some real live on the spot coaching with us because God knows we need it. <laughs> yeah, I love it. So, yeah. Oh, thank you. Eli. And I think right. people, I think people relate to examples and, and having been a mom for 19 years, mm -hmm. I know this is a common one, but I'm also perplexed. So we, if you haven't heard the episode that we did with Shafali, I talked to Shafali about this car accident my daughter and I were in, uh, mm -hmm. in, in May and um, we were rear-ended. We were okay, but it, it was like we were hit really hard. And she has been very raw since then. And Shafali mm -hmm. was sort of telling me like, well, you're trying to rush her through the process because that's what you do. And she was mm -hmm. she was right on the nose. So I have adjusted and I have <laughs> slowed down. But I'm going to give you just a tantrum example because like I don't think I'm handling it right. And yet I feel like I've tried everything. So here's what was happening. We were at Starbucks and we had gotten my daughter and her two friends refreshers, which it turns out every single Starbucks refresher has caffeine. Oh no. PSA for every parent. Okay. Th 35 milligrams. So I said, oh no to my daughter, you can't have what the other girls are having, but I'll get you this other thing that doesn't have caffeine. And by the way, the your daughter is like five, five or six. She's six. Yeah, yeah. she's little. A little, little the, the, all the girls are six. She is like, I want what they're having. And it went into like scream, like, <laughs> like zero to 60. <laughs> and so I was like, 
I tried so hard. I like fully was channeling my inner Eli. <laughs> and I tried to be like, I know that is so disappointing to like have your mom say no and the other girls have it. And like, that just sucks. I'm so sorry. But we have to go to bed on time tonight because you have a big day tomorrow. Like try to explain it. <laughs> Caffeine makes us jittery. Sometimes we stay up late. Whatever it is, I'm trying to explain it. And it's just louder, 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 louder. I tried distraction. I'm like... Well, why don't we go over to lunch? Maybe we want a sandwich, you know? Oh, look yeah. at what your friend, like, and Nothing it's just getting, it. it is, and then it is scream voice, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now my boys are a lot older. Back in the day, I would have picked them up and walked out. And she's with her best friends. I don't want to embarrass her. Would you I don't have, know. Would you have that... picked them up and walked out in a punitive way? Would it have been like, that's no, it, No, I wouldn't. Done. Right. No. It Well, maybe. <laughs> I, what I would have said and what I said to her was all of these people working here, this is too loud for their ears. Mm. People that they, they don't want, this is stressful and upsetting for them. There's other people who are trying to study and this is too loud. We can't be screaming like this in public. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go in the car and mm -hmm. scream? <laughs> yep. And yep. it was, nothing was working, Eli. Like well, I was, was trying so hijacked. hard. Yes. She was hijacked. Finally, you had a, it was you like had a loop. Keep going. Yes. 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 Finally, I it was like I said, I'm going to leave all these drinks here because I had my drink. And then she had ended up with a drink. And I'm like, and we, we I'm going to have to carry you out to the car because we can't do this. Other people. Finally, the Starbucks barista was like booted us out nicely. It was like, bye. You have to leave. Bye. And I was like, this is, so what 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 do I do? Like, what do I do? Because I tried all my things. Oh, my gosh. So first of all, what an amazing mama you are like oh, you're working you. so hard to so hard <laughs> help her contain her not overreact not underreact yeah right? like hold the boundary I mean so I just want to like applaud all the way around because that Thank was you. well done um sometimes our kids are in a state where they're so hijacked that there is no intervention in that yes. setting that will work and that doesn't mean you're failing or they're fa it's like because there was a feedback loop. So the feedback loop is she's upset. She's not getting the thing. And she's processing her friends in the same room with the thing. And it's creating a threat response in her body also. Because as a five-year-old, belonging equals we have the same things as other people. Oh. I see my I see my four and a half-year-old girls do this all the time. We'll be somewhere and they'll go, Mom, they have the same water bottle as me. Or yes, they yes, have yes. the same other thing as yes, me. Yes, they really notice. Yes. And so she's in this state of threat because in her five-year-old brain, you have just told her, you're out of the club. You don't <gasps> belong with these other girls. Oh my God. That's such a big insight. And you aren't going to be able to use that insight in Starbucks. So right. what, what I would say is at that first moment where you can see that she's like about to lose it, you mm -hmm. just, you pick her up and you go, we're going to figure this out. It's not, we're going to leave here because you're not handling this or you're overreacting. It's, we're going to figure this out. I need us to be in the car. And it, again, it's not, you need to be out of here because you're a problem for everybody else. Even yeah. though I absolutely say things like that to my kids. We all yeah. do at times. We're just desperate. We're just like, how do I get you to stop? Um, but in general, that will actually activate her threat response because now oh. she's aware that everyone else in the room everyone is else. looking at her and not liking what she's doing. And so the oh. thing, the core thing of, you know, belonging has now gotten even bigger. So like, I'm going to be thrown out of here or people aren't going to like me because I'm screaming and dysregulated. So really it's like you, you just have to know your kid and go, we're about to have a massive yeah, you see catastrophic that. meltdown over this. And so you pick them yeah. up and you say... We're going to go to the car for a minute to figure this out. And then you let them have that meltdown in the car where you're going to feel a whole lot more calm. Yeah. Because you're not having to process everyone else's experience in the public space. Yeah. And she's not having to process everyone else's experience in the public space. You know, and so you're just because I think you were doing all the right things. It just there's no way for it to get through in that context. So then now you're yeah. in the car saying, it's making you feel really bad that you can't have the same thing as your friends. Does that make you feel like you're not a part of the group? Oh, that's such a horrible it. feeling. This feels overwhelming. Yeah. Um, why can't, why can they have it and I can't? You know, and you say, yeah. oh, this is so hard. You have a mama that's extra careful about your health and your safety. And sometimes that's disappointing. I was just doing this with my son today. His, his friends with those like electric scooters. Oh, yeah. Their family is fine with their kids, like, riding them all over. And I'm like, 
not on the main streets. We're not doing it. I'm not yeah. even sure that I'm gonna, I may even be rolling that back more, but it's like, those, these are dangerous vehicles. Like, yeah. I'm not going to go 25 miles an hour on the main road over here. They're so fast. Yeah. And that's so, the hardest anyway. thing. And that continues. You do always have that thing of, yes. well, why can't they? I mean, and, and that's what ki what kids are experiencing is I'm going to lose my social capital and my belonging. And so we want mm. to help them articulate this is the fear and then walk them through that process of going, all right, let's talk about your friends. There's a lot of things that you do or they do that you all don't have with each other. Yeah. Are your friends the kind of people who will X you out if you don't have the same thing? Are they? Let's talk about that. Would you do that to a friend? You know, and they might say like, well, yeah, so-and-so doesn't have this video game and so I don't play with them and I don't want to be the kid who doesn't have the thing. And mm. you can work through that like, yeah. I'm like, gosh, that's such a big overwhelming feeling. Obviously, this is an older kid now in my yeah. brain. Um, but but I did talk about that with her where I was like, your two besties, they're still going to be your besties, uh -huh. even if you have a different drink. Yep. Uh, it was There was something else, too, that we were talking about. It wasn't about the drink, but something else. That conversation is, totally hits home that it, the idea of it being more primal than we realize. Yeah. Of It's just like, honey, you have a different drink. It's just as good. No, yeah, it means it, I'm so out. Spoiled. Yes. Yeah. It, this kid's not going to, my best friend's not going to love me. Like, it's yeah. so big. That makes it make so much more sense. Yeah. And again, we can't always intervene with the behavior. So like there are going to be days where you get to the car, they keep having the meltdown and eventually you realize this is not going anywhere. We're not, yeah. we're not cresting. This is just too hard. We might just need to go home and process this at home. Um, or you get to a place where you can kind of work with it and you say, well, let's, what can our plan be? Let's talk about some options. Option one is we can get a strawberry frappuccino, whatever those are called. Yeah. Right? A frappe something. You know, something, option, something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Option Kick two, pop, option, whatever. option two is that, you know, we can come up with a fun game for you and your friends to play that's less focused on the drinks, you know, whatever. Let's talk about it. At first, they're going to reject everything you say because they're still yeah. in that neurochemical overload. And so you give them time to move through it and you're assessing, are they moving through it? Is it cresting? Can we get somewhere with this? And then you kind of get them back on board and you do the thing. But it's hard. This is going back to Andrea. This is hard. It is hard. Is it developmentally normal for five, six-year-olds to have tantrums like that? Like, yes. in my mind, it's not, but it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Okay. And what I would say is, first of all, we're still learning so much about the human brain. You know, yeah. like, what we know about the human brain, the, the most clear thing we know is how little we know about the human yeah. brain. <laughs> so we're still learning. But in general, zero to seven is, is a time of life where the average kid is going to struggle with impulse control and emotions of uh, and handling grief and disappointment. It yeah. gets easier after seven. There should be sort of a gradual tolerance and increase of that capacity over time. Okay. But you have kids who have different neurotypes and they're going to That's struggle it, yeah. with it more and longer and more with more intensity. You know, highly sensitive kids, kids on the spectrum, kids with ADHD, like we're going to expect them to have more frequent reactions and more intense reactions. And here's the thing, though, whether they have one of those neurodiverse brain types or not, all of our kids need the same thing, which is that us as an adult is going, here's the boundary. I'm going to keep it. Here's the yeah. compassion. I'm going to keep it. And I'm going to practically make the decision whether this environment is a place where we can process and regulate or if we need mm. a new environment to process and regulate. And I'm not punishing you by taking you out of this room because that's a very different emotional feeling from us. It's like, hey, we can't regroup here. We're going to go regroup this in the car. This is not working. Yep. We're going to yeah. go regroup in the car. Oh, we're going to need to re go regroup at home. And sometimes, you know, I mean, you know, this is a parent. They go to sleep that night and the next morning they're like, hi, mama. And you're like, oh, yeah, they're perfectly fine. 25 oh minutes gosh, later. I thought for yeah. sure this was going to be the topic in your therapy 10 years from now. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't even remember what happened. Holy Moses. <laughs> Well, what, oh, I think is, what I think is amazing about this, it comes from the your your energy and your intention, right? Because you mm -hmm. can say the same words. Yes. We have to, we're going outside to regroup. Versus, yeah. ooh, like my, like yes. my uh, you know, Grover voice or whatever. Uh, um, yeah. Versus, ooh, 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 we got to, honey, we got to go outside to regroup, right? Yeah. Like that, like we are, we all are so, uh, I mean, 70% of our communication is nonverbal. And yes. so when I think about tone of voice, and I think about fa facial expressions and intent. Yep. And, and I mean, even deeper than that, you talk a lot about, and I, I, we try to keep it jargon free around here on open relationships, but this idea of co-regulation. Yes. When I'm calm, 
between the neuro, the mirror neurons yeah. um, and just and my heart rate and all those things and my facial expressions, all those things that our nervous system so beautifully communicate to my kids or, or anybody, my husband, you know, anybody that that there could be a disconnect with um, or or we say, oh, I got to I got to get get back to that calm <laughs> so that in addition to the words lining up, that there is a feeling of safety. There's a and that felt takes experience. There's a felt experience. I mean, the way I like yeah. to describe this to parents is your children need to borrow your connectedness and your calmness. Right. And so if you're in a moment and you know the script and the script might be, we need to change environments, right? You have to think about how it's coming across. So if I walk in the room to you and I say, it's so good to see you. You did not receive the message that I'm happy to see. No, you did. Yeah. Especially knowing you. And if you're wearing that gold <laughs> jumpsuit that I want to borrow, <laughs> then, uh, then hey. yeah. No, but totally. So, it really is so how, set intention. Does my affect, affect means emotional state and how it's portrayed on my face and in my voice and in my, the tension in my body. You know, are my, fen are my fists clenched? That's mm -hmm. probably going to communicate to my child that we're getting ready for a roost. Right. Yeah. Am I receptive and calm enough? And is my mind interpreting my child through a lens of dignity? So what mm. I would struggle with in that Starbucks situation, especially as a parenting expert that people now recognize in the world, that's mm. a whole weird mm -hmm. thing. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I would struggle with the potential fear or judgment that that certain people would have where they would look at my child and say, what a spoiled brat. See, this is what yep. this gets you. Yeah. Um, and so then. I would have to work to regulate that interpretation out of my brain so that I could look at my child and go, there's something here. I may not know what it is. I may not have that insight right in that moment that, my, that this is a belonging issue. I just have to trust that my child is feeling something for a reason, that there is yeah. always a dignity in human emotion. And we might have to get to the bottom of it. It might be something, you know, that's coming out sideways. We, last week, we lost um, one of our kitty cats for six days. Mm. Six days. She oh. came back. We have her. Oh Henrietta gosh. is home. But for six days, we didn't know where our beloved kitty cat was. And it was really emotional and awful. And kids don't know how to process something like that. Grownups don't know how to process something like yeah. that, right? No. I'm and glad so she's there back. Were these, thank goodness. But there were these moments of deep reactive emotion. And I can just assume that they were affected by this feeling of not knowing where our precious kitty cat was, that that was in their nervous system and they didn't know what to do with it. And so it would come out sideways when, no, I'm so sorry, we're out of popsicles, right? Like, yes. And and so I think if we can look at our children and go, okay, you're feeling this for a reason, that doesn't mean so you can have the caffeinated beverage at five years old. Yeah. It means I am going to respond to you with humanity, I am not yeah. going to shame you and shut you down and mock you and label you. I'm going to be here for you. Well, I want to jump in with I, I want to jump in with a couple of quick things. One, just to rewind, you said something really profound. Our kids need to borrow our calmness, mm -hmm. and I haven't heard that. And you certainly say it in in different ways in the book. But just just as everybody listening, and even for myself, like. Oh, when my kids are dysregulated and they're being, I mean, my kids are teens and tweens, so <laughs> whew, it can get, it can get uh, awfully spicy um, yes. for me just to have that, that little mnemonic that says, oh, my kids need to borrow my calmness now. Yeah. That, that feels like a hook, right? That yeah. I, I certainly want to take away. And then I love your point about the dignity and I'm going to, uh, when it comes to those big emotions, I'm going to out myself a little bit here. I've literally said to myself when I'm so fuming and I feel so, um, hurt and angry by what's going on with my kids. Mm -hmm. I've literally had to say to myself, Andrea, these are your kids. They're not your enemy. Right. Yes. But, but sometimes you feel like that independent of their age. And I just, yes. I love that as a hook too, to say those big emotions, they're trying their best. Yes you know, meet those big emotions with dignity and let them borrow your calm. You can only let, I, I love, I always say it, Marion Williamson's, you can't give what you don't have. And mm -hmm. I can't let mm -hmm. them borrow my freaking calm if yeah. I don't have it. And I love yes. in your book, you talk a lot about um, 
the steps that you urge people to take because so, I mean, you actually say about 50% of us were not raised with secure attachment. Is that, is oh, that, yeah. did I remember yep. that? Yes. So that job. means, you know, good news, a bunch of us did, bad news, a bunch of us didn't. Yes. And when I think about the, you know, that's a big freaking number, right? Yes. I mean, you know, many, many, I mean, many, 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 many billion people in the world. So we're talking 4 billion people. Right, exactly. And so when I think about what we have to do to effectively reparent ourselves when we didn't get that secure attachment and we're trying to do that and our kid is is melting down because, you know, stupid Starbucks put too much caffeine. Like, can't they just make a drink that's caffeine free, that's pink or whatever? You know what I mean? Like, if you yeah. order lemonade at Starbucks, it should not have caffeine. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my God. No, no. Thing? My, okay, my I wants this for like all the things. He wants there to be like a Sprite-ish option oh, yeah. in a restaurant, you know, where that's all you have to say to the the restaurant. Oh, we want we want the um, the premium sprite, yeah, right. And it's like, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. this is the one without sugar. Fabulous. Well, my, like, you know, oh. my 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 family, my in laws are Indian, and so the in the word the word Hindi means, um, um pani means water. So they would always uh, for their kids, they would order Coco Pani. Mm. So like watered down Coca Cola still has caffeine. But not quite Brilliant. as much. So yeah, cocoa, just like water that pony. down. Yes, yeah, exactly. Bright pony or, or whatever. Okay, so I've got um, a question for you. You you really lift lifted some anxiety from my heart when you talked mm. in the book about lying and mm. how common that is. Like, yes. oh my God, I have I I really have. Um, I think I've been misguided in what I have seen about lying in 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 one or both potentially, of my kiddos. And it was helpful for you to say lying is normal. I was like, yes. oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, but It I, took you out of but, a catastrophic risk, fear place. Well, and you give a little explanation to that, too. Um, our My mom, she misrepresented a lot. And so no. I think, and so you, you also helped me feel seen. You're saying what I got from the book is you were like, listen, if you're getting, if this is hypersensitive to you, it's probably because of how you were raised. And yes. so, I mean, to me, integrity is above almost everything else. Mm -hmm. Like I, you know, maybe to a fault at times. I mean, listen, I keep telling myself, my, my kids out there, you know, Christmas and the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus, but I am like, okay, <laughs> like, like carve that out. And I know some mm -hmm. parents are like, no, we don't even do that, but that's sure. another discussion. Um, but I just, so, so thank you for that. Yes. Um, what do you do when either you're sure your kid is lying or you're pretty sure and they refuse to come clean. Yes. So the first thing I do is I make sure that I'm not overreacting and I'm not underreacting. So overreacting is projecting my child's behavior into the future as like, this is it. They're going to become a pathological liar and a sociopath mm -hmm. and they can't be trusted. Mm -hmm. right? And underreacting is like, I don't want, I don't even know how to deal with this. I don't want to even say anything. I'm just going to like wait for them to come clean and hope they do someday. You know, it's like mm -hmm. they need our help in those moments. Um, so I always tell myself, if my child is lying or I think they're lying, then there's something stuck in our honesty dynamic. Mm -hmm. So my goal is not to get my child not to lie. It's to get my child to have the skills for honesty. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, what's going on here? It might be a developmental thing. Um, it might be a dynamic thing, something going on between us. Um, again, another reason to be really thoughtful about punishment in our relationship to our children is that punishment and honesty don't go hand in hand. So if we want our children to be authentic and honest with us, we can't put, put a setup there that says, when you mess up, I'm going to intentionally inflict some kind of suffering for you. Because then why would I want to be honest with you? That doesn't make any sense. So we do have to make some choices in our process. Do we want to have control over our children or do we want to have influence and connection with our children? And influence and connection is much messier. You know, I, I get the knee-jerk reaction to go to control because it is hard to sit in this idea that I'm going to have to tolerate some things that my kids do that I don't like and that mm -hmm. I think aren't good for them and us. Anyway. So I'm going to give you an example of um, like an eight, nine-year-old lie, and then I'm going to give you an example of a teen lie mm -hmm. because they often have different stakes, and that's where it also gets tricky. Mm -hmm. So my, you know, seven, eight-year-old just would prefer not to brush his teeth. It's just a yeah. sensory thing, right? Oh, yeah. Good. We've been to that one, too. Have you brushed yeah. your teeth? 
Dragon breath. Yep. Yes. No, 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 you haven't. I can smell it. Right. You know, so, I mean, it's, again, it's not about, have you brushed your teeth? Yeah. Let me smell your breath. Uh-huh. Like, there's that kind of, like, energy in there that's that's adversarial. Yeah, right? yeah, Versus, yeah, totally. like, hey, would you do me a solid and just blow me a little bit of that morning breath so that I can check that we've got some mint or strawberry on it? You know, there's a energy in how we do that. Totally. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, you can even pause and go, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you brush your teeth. Thank you so much. Um, I am remembering how when I was a kid, I didn't always love doing those things. It felt kind of annoying. And so sometimes I would just say I did them even though I didn't. Has that ever happened for you? And, you know, it depends on the day my kid might come come clean. That definitely has happened where he's like, yeah, I'll go brush my teeth. You know, or or they're like, no. I never have. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, well, you must be more mature at your age than I was at my age, but um, I'm glad to hear that. And and I'm not necessarily obsessing about that brush then at that moment, but I'm just put, planting the seed in there to come clean. Um, my kids often come clean to me about things I didn't even know they were lying about. My four and a half year old last week oh came God. to me with a $20 bill she had taken out of my purse <laughs> and literally <laughs> had hidden it in her room. She came to me. She goes, I took this from you. I was like, <laughs> oh, Thank you so much for telling me and bringing that back. I really need this money. And that is such a gift. And that's yeah. it. Like, she doesn't need a punishment. She, she was sitting there with her guilt. Her yeah. oh, her glee of having gotten the $20 was quite profound. That's what got mm-hmm. her to take it. But, like, I understand that. If you found $20 somewhere, it would be kind of exciting in general. And if you're four mm-hmm. years old, it's like winning the lottery, right? So we have to have compassion and understanding and look what's going on developmentally. I'm going to tell you a story that my dental hygienist told me this week. She was such a brilliant parent. I'm laying there with my mouth open just listening to her talk about parenting through the teen years and just like taking notes. But she was talking about this moment where um, she has very specific families that her daughter, her 16-year-old daughter, is allowed to spend the night at whose houses, right? So it's basically like if she knows there's parents there that are fairly responsible, blah, blah, blah. So there's this one kid. Let's call her Darla. I don't think that's her name. She's not allowed to sleep at Darla's house because Darla's parents are pretty much never there. There's a lot of drugs and alcohol activity. It's just like a no. And this mom said, you know, for me, with my kids, I won't track you till you give me a reason to. So I don't have any tracking on my kids. She said, but she had this thing in her car that she had forgotten about. And I can't remember why it was on the car. So anyway, so her daughter had taken her car that night, said she was spending the night at one place. And she got this alert at like two in the morning for some reason and checked her phone for something else. Anyway, she noticed. She probably had an air tag on like a laptop bag or something. Yeah, something. Yeah. Yeah. So she noticed. So she discovers she's at Darla's house. And what I love about this mom is that she didn't call at 2 a.m. She didn't rush over there. She didn't overreact in the moment. She just went, we're going to talk about this. This this has to be addressed. So, you know, her daughter comes home in the morning. She's like, how was it? you know, blah, blah, blah. That was so great, whatever. And she said that, you know, she was like, I'm just so thankful we have such a great community. I'm going to call Barbara and just tell her, thank you so much for having you. I mean, this is just brilliant parenting, right? It's like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm going to keep giving you the opportunity to come clean. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, she's like, oh, no, no, you don't need to call her. Little. And she's like, well, no, I'm, I'm going to. Don't even worry about it. I just, I love her. I'm going to give her a call, whatever. And then she's like, mom, I have to tell you something. You know, and then she tells a lie. She doesn't say she's at Darla's house. She says she's oh, at Brandy's my. house. Oh, no. Because she knows she's not supposed to be at Darla's house, right? And and what she did was so brilliant is she said, okay, so tell me more about being at Brandy's house and blah, blah, blah. And then kind of did the same thing. Well, then I'll, I'm, I, I'm, I'm disappointed that you didn't tell me the truth and we need to figure this out. Um, I am going to call Brandy's mom. too. It's, it's like she's going to keep creating the accountability. Um, and then, you know, eventually she comes clean and says... You know, I wasn't there. I think she actually said one more thing to her. She said, I'm having a hard time trusting this story since yeah. I know you didn't tell me the truth. I'm, I'm having a hard time. And then she said, could you tell me it again? <laughs> and it was just like, she again, it's not overreactive. It's not underreactive. And the, and the yeah. child can feel mom's on to me. Yeah. Um, and she said, so here's what's going to happen is that we're going to put Life360 on your phone now. Yep. And it's not... You are being punished. I'm so disappointed in you. We don't have to like slam the lesson. It's just 
I, I, I'm, I've got a trust issue now around this. Um, this is the consequence for it. And you can earn yourself off of Life360 by continuing to be where you tell me you're going to be. And, and that's you all know, one that. thing I told my kids yeah. about Life360 was uh, the same thing. I didn't put it on their cars, their phones. I didn't track them until they got in trouble. And then they got tra- And I said, I want you to have a reason to tell your friends you can't break the rule. Hmm. My mom's tracking me. My mom's got Life360. My mom's going to know. My mom is strict. I'm like, I, when it comes down to it, you could even get around Life360. But Definitely. I want you to be able to be like, I don't want to have to get to that level. I don't <laughs> want to have to figure out how to get around it. I want to be able to just have this reason to think twice about the choice to break yeah. the rule. And yes. that's that's the kind of thing that that something like Life360 does. We probably used it six months total with right. our teenagers. You don't necessarily need it. And, and again, our goal is not to control our children. It is to yeah. ha- scaffold them. And the reality of teenagers is that they have enough brain activity going on their brains. They're actually more like toddlers than any other stage of development. They're having new neural connections constantly being made, which means they have low impulse control and high risk seeking. So there's a desire and a drive for novelty and new things without that little little minion in their head going, is this a good idea? Maybe we shouldn't do this. Right? They so need we, something we to need get to in that. there. Well, and that's, yeah. that's why you want to have a positive relationship with them. Because if, if you have a, a negative control-based dynamic, everything you say, everything that comes out of your mouth is going to sound like an attempt to control them. Okay. So we want to have enough of a positive relationship that you can be that little minion going, hey, I want to just put something out there. I know you guys are going cruising. I know you said you're going down to Chatfield Lake. I just want to remind you that water and alcohol don't mix very well and not just in a bottle in general. So if you Uh guys are going to be out there, somebody, I would hope everybody needs to be pretty sober because if someone Uh falls in that water and they are drunk and someone doesn't see it, that's how a life ends. And so I'm just going to just putting it out there. I'm just reminding you, you know, but if you have a tense conversation around that of like, you better not be drinking down there. Yeah. Nothing's going on. I love that, Eli. I mean, and you, and the book is so filled with those really practical little hooks and tips Uh and you give, you know, you give really some just really wonderful nuggets that, that help as a parent, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm like, taken a million i read the book i've watched all your tiktoks and instagrams and i'm still learning from you (laughs) like uh just this idea it's just hard i mean i i I come from a lot of dysfunction and dysregulation and honestly here's what i'll say i guess finally about your book um oh my i felt i felt guilt right and i'm just saying this for the parents who are like me who have you know like and here's the thing there is hardly a parent that has tried harder than i have Right. I mean, I, fr- I mean, I freaking try hard and I care so deeply. And so then to feel like, oh, and I've still screwed it up. Like, oh my God, <laughs> like I need that fork, like right in my neck. And so I say this because while I felt that and you talk about the grief and I can't remember the exact word you use, something about like, there was an example of like the pain is the pain. And anyway, yeah, I don't want to go on here for the, the pain tangent. is the pain. Oh, right. Exactly. And I thought to myself in those moments, oh, but Andrea, this is why you have this beautiful book and mm. why you, you know, my kids are only nine and, and, or excuse me, 11 and 14. Like, oh, you get to give yourself another shot and just continue yes. to to do better. And now, which is going to lead to my, I think we probably have time for just one or two more last questions. So, so hang on, let me, I, I feel like I'm kind of going on two tangents. So I felt that, I felt that paying and I also felt a lot of hope and felt like um there's just so much for me to to take away as a parent that is so you know deeply committed uh to the well-being of my kids and 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 you may you know again not to sound like it's heavy it's not heavy it's just you know for me reading it it's like okay it's a sacred topic we're talking about the love we're giving to our children it's it's healing you know for the parents like me probably like all of us we're healing ourselves. And you talk about that too. What you, you know, I love, I, I love your mom and the rent a friend that just cracks me up every time I hear that. <laughs> but you talk about her experience and her courage and how open <laughs> she was and, you know, the depression and so forth that she went to that she got help. So it made your lift lighter. Less. Not mm-hmm. yeah, not, yeah. not easy by any means. And so again, I just say that no matter where you are on the parenting journey, 
that even if it's like, oh, it feels kind of dark and heavy, it's like there there's so much in this book that is helpful and actionable. Good. And then well, I, I want to be able to ask. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I want to respond to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just say that there is no parent who reflects on their parenting. Well, okay, let me say this. There is no non-narcissistic parent <laughs> <laughs> who reflects on their parenting and can't find a bunch of things you wish you had done differently. I mean, yeah. I have that every day. And, and you do say it's, that in the book. You did let me off the really hook. You're like, if you're important. getting it right 30% of the time, you're winning. Yes. <laughs> like, great. This is huge. But but I also think that it is important for us to kind of contend with some of those things and go, oh, my stuff was, you know, in between me and my kid and I couldn't see them clearly. And so I was reacting out of my stuff and I mm -hmm. that may have had an impact. We want to be able to do that because someday our kids get to the place where in their mid-20s and they start to deconstruct their life and they're like, what? Mm -hmm. You're a person? And you mm -hmm. didn't do it all right. And they do yeah. need us to be sturdy enough in our imperfections that they can come to us and say, why did you do this? I wish you hadn't done that. This felt painful. You've got it this. And that we can go, yeah, that makes sense. I can hear you. Yeah. You know, and, and so I think I don't, my goal is not to give my children a perfect childhood or for them to have you know, the experience of nothing ever was bad or hard with my mom. My hope is that they have a deep core sense of my mom really cares about me, what I feel, okay. what I need, and will put in the work to own her shit when it gets mm -hmm. in the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're doing that. Oh, that's a well, really I, good mama. I am. Well, thank you. In fact, so my last question was, you know, and this is uh, everybody listening is like, Andrea, get over yourself. How do I know if I have a secure relationship with my kid? <laughs> I mean, not just asking for me. I think everybody listening to this, because if yes. you're listening to this, you're obviously a, a parent that cares. So for those of us who are a little uncertain, what do you know, are there are there um, traits or what do you mm -hmm. what do you look for to kind of give yourself that sense of. Okay, so it looks gonna, different you know, in different stages uh -huh. when they are young. So I would say really up and through elementary school, what you want to see is that when your child feels scared mm -hmm. or deeply tender, that they seek you out, they cling to you, and they mm -hmm. find your responses soothing to them. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be so variant depending on the kid because you're going to have kids that you know, are really kind of just chill and like life just doesn't bother them all that much. And that doesn't necessarily mean they're not securely attached to you. It just might mean they have a very chill temperament and a lot mm -hmm. of privilege. <laughs> or you mm -hmm. might have a kid who is highly sensitive. And while they do seek you out, it's hard for them to regulate their nervous system because they have interoception overload, mm -hmm. which just basically means their body floods them with more feelings and sensations than the average kid. Um, that doesn't mean they're not securely attached. You're really looking for, does my child believe that I will show up for them and mm -hmm. help them regulate when they are when they are feeling overwhelmed by life? Mm -hmm. um, and then when we get into adolescence, we have a stage that we call attachment transfer, where kids start practicing closer relationships with their peers. So mm -hmm. what we want to look for there is do they seek us in the big moments? You know, they have a big breakup. Are they coming to us in that moment? Are they mm -hmm. are they dialoguing? And then the, the this is a Dan Siegel kind of concept, but I love it. He's like, what's the music? What's the music of your relationship? You know, is it dun, dun, dun? Oh, wow. You know, like, is it playful? Is it light? Do are there moments of sweetness? Um, and, and we are the conductor of the symphony. So if the music is feeling off, it's probably because we're conducting with a little bit too tight of a fist. Like, what does it look like to, you know, slow it down and get those rhythms and melodies and sing? Um, my favorite easy hack for thinking about what we need to do as parents in order to cultivate this are these four things. We need to light up around our kids. They need to know that we want them in the room, that we find them delightful, that it is an honor to be their parent, to be near them, um, not for something that they're doing, not for their good behavior, just for their presence. We need to show up in their tender and triumphant moments. So in the moments when they are flooded with emotion and they are needing our support, but also in those milestones, you know, like, do you go to the kindergarten graduation? Go! 
you teach them how to catch a ball? Teach them how to catch a ball. Like, did you listen to them recite the poem at the end of the year or whatever? Like, do what you can to show up. And and these things don't have to be done perfectly. Again, we're going back to that statistic, 30 to 50% of the time. But consistently, does your child know my parent's going to show up for me? Mm -hmm. Listen up. There is so much bonding power in feeling that someone hears us and actually listens to us. Mm -hmm. And I mean full frontal listening, right? This is not, oh, that's nice, sweetheart. I'm cooking. I'm have social rubber. I tell my I tell my kids, listen with your eyes. Mm, right? I love that. Like I, like I want, like if you're listening to me, I, I want to see your eye, like eyes here. Uh, so, eyes. Yeah, so, so listen up. And then here's the last one. Makeup. You be the leader in repair. When things are off tracks, even if it's off tracks because your kid is actually just being a royal pain in the butt, mm -hmm. you're still the leader in the repair. Hey, kid, I can tell you're not doing okay because you're not acting okay. What's going on? Right? Or, you know, hey, so sorry I was being so harsh or unfair. I was really not focusing well or thinking well. Or, you know what? I'm sorry. I think you maybe have noticed I've been really distracted with work lately. Like, that's has that been hard for you? Uh, we are in charge of the repair process. And by doing that, our children learn how to be responsibly repairing people in the world, both with us later on and with their friends and with their other important attachment figures. So we're lighting up, showing up, listening up, and making up. And if you're doing those things consistently, you're doing great. Eli, I love that you have repair that doesn't necessarily involve going and apologizing. Mm. But it's still repair for if if someone is off flying off the handle, I don't want them to learn that I'm going to apologize to them. <laughs> but I do want them to feel safe and make space for repair. And the repair doesn't have to be, I'm so sorry that I breathed wrong and you lost your mind at me. Mm -hmm. But it can be like, hey, that was a rough moment, like you said. Yeah. And like, hey, like, what's you want to talk about it? I love you. It seems like something's happening. And whenever you're ready to talk, that. I love that as repair. That's not a false apology. Right. And so repair at its core is reconnection. It's getting our bodies and our hearts and our minds and our nervous systems in sync again. We've mm. gotten out of sync. So the symphony, you know, it's like I was over here playing an A note and you went off on like a B flat and it was not, you know, harmonious. And so yeah. I'm going to figure out how to get myself into a B flat. Yeah. So that we're get back in tune. We're back in tune mm -hmm. together. Yeah. And then we're gonna get up to that A in in process together with with a lot less of the you know, nails yep. on the chalkboard yep. experience. I'm going well, to I'll just say return that. to you. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I'll just say that it is very reassuring to me to hear what you were saying about it being like, what's the music? Is it fun music? Is it lighthearted? And Andrea, I will just say, considering that all of our boys between us troll us like nonstop <laughs> is probably a good sign that oh, yeah. they feel secure because like if you have a parent that you're not secure with you don't tease them and, no. and our kids are not mean to us but like you know Andrea got to see yesterday my son showed her all of his garments that he buys just to annoy me like his <laughs> I heart emo girls t-shirt and he was showing them off to her he and I delighted in, in it. I'm like, she loved more, it, guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah and I'm but like, like that bussin'. So then he could really cringe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. My one of my favorite mentors, she passed away a few years ago, but her name is Dr. Karen Purvis. She says, families that play together stay together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's so much in this because when we are in in real play, real safe play, goofiness, right? That's what you're <laughs> describing. They know yeah. you're going to understand their intention is goofy. Um it it cultivates the experience of feeling safe in our brain. So, you know, that sense of this is where I belong, this is where I'm known, this is where I'm seen is accentuated mm -hmm. when we add playfulness. And if you grew up in trauma, I know a lot of trauma survivors who would say one of the hardest things I had to learn was how to have fun. Because, yeah. because having fun and being playful means letting my guard down. And that wasn't what I ever learned how to do. My nervous system said, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. So I love this. Um, and you know, someday if your kid comes to you and say, I didn't, I didn't feel secure in childhood, there's still an opportunity for security there. You say, thank yeah. you so much for telling me that. What was well, it? That I've always called secure? my boys, my little Buddhas, because I've learned a ton from them and having come from a lot of chaos and dysfunction, 
And even now, I mean, and Joanna, thanks, you know, thanks for the, you know, you and I obviously are close and, you know, we talk a, a lot about, you know, motherhood and so forth. And so for me, it's even like, like on the one hand, intellectually, I know, um, I mean, I do have the most amazing kids. It's like, you know, I can just talk <laughs> for days about all these ways that it's like, oh my God, they're amazing. And, yeah. you know, who, the, and who they are, right. Less about accomplishments than who they yeah. are, what, you know, how their friends feel about them, how, you know, how, you know, big hearted they are. But when I think about, um, you know, my own insecurities and the, uh, the journey that I've gone through as a human being, you know, in this instance, particularly as a mom, it's like, Ooh, there, there has been for me, a lot of healing has been required. And so I just, I share that vulnerability because I, I know there are a lot of moms like me who are just like, oh, I'm trying so freaking hard. And even yeah. though we're doing a, a, a good to great job most of the time, and I, I'll say I, that is the case. Um, yet there is still that feeling for me of like, oh, but it's still not enough. Right. And then yeah. that yucky kind of perfectionism and judgment yeah. and all that bubbles up. And so it's just, it's again, just in the spirit of ooh, keeping it real, that even if you're doing a good job, you may still feel, at least I do, those feelings of, oh, crap. You know, I just like, don't I... think anyone is doing a great job. Oh, in, in, <laughs> well, that's and good. I think that we are, <laughs> and our goal, according to the research, is to do a good enough job. Mm -hmm. Our goal mm -hmm. is to have a yeah. pattern with our kids that is consistent enough that inside their brain, they go, my, my parent is there for me. Yeah. Sure. Are they there for me every second of every day, all the time, in every single way I want them to? No, that's not a thing. No. Yeah. But they're there for me. And if I really needed them, I know they would help me show up for me and they care about me and they want me around. Okay. Right. So you're doing that. I'm not yeah. remotely worried about you not doing that. You're doing that. And oh, you're well. giving them so much fun. Like your kids yeah. have so much fun. Oh, like, yeah. That's we do. what you want from childhood. Yes. Fun. Love it. Love it. Same. All right, Eli, you are brilliant. Congratulations mm -hmm. on your beautiful new book, Raising Thank Securely you. Attached Kids. If you're lucky enough to live near a Barnes & Noble or, you know, a real yes. physical bookstore, go and buy it today. If you didn't pre-order, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it any anywhere where you get your books. And it is it is a just a beautiful, beautiful read. Thank so you. I encourage all the parents out there and, you know, even you give a little shout out to some of the grandparents and, mm -hmm. you know, the aunties and uncles and, the, you know, the other caregivers. So um, so this Love is a book for a lot of people. Thank you Thanks, so Eli. much. We look forward to having you back. There's still so much we didn't cover, amazingly enough. So many more conversations to come. Love you, Eli. She is just the best. So wise and so joyful and practical. Like she just she is amazing. Um. Joanna, what's your number one takeaway that you are going to apply today and forever from our conversation? You know, as we talked about in the episode, I love the idea of having make repair doesn't mean you have to apologize. Not because I don't want to apologize, but because I haven't wanted to be fake or impose kind of a fake need for apology in order to make a repair. It seems obvious now, but just the idea of coming together to mend mm -hmm. being healing is really wonderful. Yeah. Well, I'm going to add on to that by just just the the statement repair equals reconnection. Mm. That that hits and it mm -hmm. just feels like what what feels terrible to me when I'm disconnected with my kids because, you know, something has gone wrong and, you know, either I've overreacted or I've withdrawn or or whatever and we're all feeling pretty crummy this idea of the repair, the intention being, let, you know, it, you know, and in our family, we do make apologies when appropriate. Um, so I like your point. It's not even always about the, the apology, but the idea of the repair equals the reconnection. So we don't feel hurt and alone, which is something that I've had a tendency to withdraw. And it just, it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm making it worse for myself. So the yeah. idea of repair equals reconnection is, um, to me, that's just a great uh, framing. Uh, what about Brian? What about you? Um, yeah, I got uh, two very, very quick ones. Um, one, I did not know that one in four people are estranged from their parents. That That's a bigger number than call. I realized. Blows the mind. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's I mean, no way, bueno. though. That's like super no Well, bueno. think of all the deadbeat dads of different generations that would yeah. count as estrangement, even if you didn't do it on purpose. 
Yeah. Yeah, and, but I also and... just think about what what that means downstream, and I realize there are, there are a handful of kids who have had whether it's a deadbeat dad or a deadbeat mom um, mm-hmm. have been able to go on and be really wonderful parents. But I do oh. feel like it makes it that much harder to have to figure it out on your own, right? So it just, it doesn't, that that statistic doesn't give me a lot of um, optimism. Yeah, it was, to me, it was that. And then, of course, that I'm sitting there reflecting on like, oh, me and my dad, you know, whatever. But then, um, uh, but I also liked Eli's I Was a Karen story because like what she was going through at the time is like so intense and your your mind and emotions and everything oh, are I all was over a the Karen, place. Oh, I Was a Karen, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think you um, said I was a parent. I thought I, that's what I No, heard. he oh. said Karen. I think oh, he okay. said Karen. Okay, got yeah, it, got it, got it. Got it. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, I was a Karen. Um, but yeah, when she was going through all that, because it, it, I mean, like, God, it, it, and it's just one of those things that, that always kind of reminds you, like, you never really know what someone's going through. Yep. Like, you you want to, like, blame this person for being X way or Y way, and you're like, oh, I bet you you're, you know... Uh, just some spoiled brat and you're like lashing out because you're not getting your way. And it's like, yeah, no, that's literally not what happened. And, yeah. and it's just funny. Cause like on the, you know, I'm here in New York and there's a lot of like little silly stuff where it's like, if someone's being like, you know, weird to you on the street, just like don't engage or, you know, whatever, because like that person might be willing to risk it all today. You don't know what they've been through today, you know? And, and it's funny to kind of see the opposite side of that where it's like someone can be hurting on the inside and lashing mm-hmm. out and it's like, I don't know, there's just a lot of like But it's two sides of the same, yeah. the same coin. When I was young working in retail, I was probably 23 and knew nothing of the world. And there was this one couple that would come in and she was always a little testy and she was so rude one day, so rude. And I was like just aghast and her husband walked up to me and he said, just... I'm not excusing that she's being rude. He said, but we just had our fourth transfer with IVF and it didn't take. And so we found out we're not pregnant. She's just the, hor- the hormones and the injections and this loss. Yep. And I remember just being like, oh, my entire world just changed. <laughs> like yep. I just had never thought about what that rude person might be going through. You yeah. know? Yeah. I mean, that's why empathy is a superpower. I mean, it really is. And it, it's just like, and by the way, even if one of those people that we are empathetic to are really jerks, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, who yeah. cares? You know, let's just yeah. assume, let's assume that, the, you know, the best of them, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt that they are going through something brutal and and we're better for it, right? I mean, it's like kind of the most rational thing we can do is to be empathetic starting with our kids, but to, but to each other and to ourselves, like really. Well, and like, if you want to see the, how mirror neurons work, if you have somebody who's really crabby, who's a bar- barista or a server or something, and you take a, a beat, look them in the eye, smile, and just acknowledge some reality of like, yes. it's hot in here, isn't it? You must be hot. Or, oh my gosh, that person ahead of me was so rude. I'm so sorry. You yes. can see them be like, oh, somebody. Yes, totally. I mean, or God, what a busy day it is for you. Yes, I've what had that day. experience yeah. so many times where it's mm-hmm. just, it is instantaneous. It's a beautiful connection. Even if you never see that person again, it's like, yeah. okay, something just happened and that's cool. Yeah. You know, now that, yep. that's yeah, I awesome. felt like a human for 30 seconds. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no. And, and sometimes yeah. they continue to be crabby. Okay, well you tried. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, but the kindness of strangers, we can't underestimate just what a, a positive impact we can have in in these really really what seeming what feel like seemingly teeny tiny ways it's a great reminder thank you for watching and or listening please subscribe follow us like us we are bringing you the show with our whole hearts so we hope you are loving it as much as we are loving producing it thanks for tuning in we'll see you next time